and often that you don't know any more about God than you know his word. Now, you might know what you heard, but do you really know his word? Amen. And you need to be able to understand how to appropriate God's word and use it uh, in your life. Glory to God. So tonight, I'm going to turn this class over to, uh, amen, our instructor for tonight, our facilitator, amen, uh, honorable man, as I've already stated, a man that I love, a son in the gospel, glory to God, and he's going to come and to share, glory to God, he is the pastor of the uh, Shekinah Christian Fellowship of San Francisco, this is the pastor Tyrone Hillman, you all receive him, put some hearts up and hands up, glory to God, and receive him tonight, glory to God, come on, Pastor Hillman. Amen and amen. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Well, the word of the Lord declares, have faith in God. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and to be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things he have said, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I honor our risen Redeemer, who is soon to return for a church without spot or wrinkle. I also, I join you all, as you all can imagine and can see that my uh, my scripture reading is my song. Amen. I'm, I'm taking that with me, y'all. Amen. Uh, but I do want to celebrate uh, your very own Superintendent Simpkins, uh, who is an amazing man of God, so much wisdom, so much incredible kindness. And, uh, and for that, I give God glory. I also want to celebrate uh, your first lady. First lady Simpkins, I love you. I love you. I love you. I still remember some of the just amazing words that outstanding words that you have spoken into my life uh, that still resonate and with me on this day. So thank you so much uh, for the spirit and presence of the Lord that is with you. Also want to thank God for tonight's facilitator. God bless you, sir. And then I also want to celebrate uh, Sister Hunter, thank you, thank you, thank you. She has been amazing as a coordinator with our church administrator, who's also helpful uh, with helping to distribute the notes uh, to you all uh, that you all should have a copy of. And then I also want to thank and praise God for our very own Shekinah family, uh, who's also participating. First Lady, I don't know if you can see her, but Lady D is also on here somewhere. Amen. She might be in route picking up kids from ballet and what have you, but uh, she's on there, I believe. And then also to the rest of the Shekinah family celebrates you, love you, and thank you so much for participating. And then also I want to thank God for my own son who is helping his dad out with uh, with coordinating. Now I'm seeing some notes here. Is the volume still low for y'all or y'all is everybody able to hear? Y'all good? We good? Okay. All right. I got a thumb. It's it's kind of low. It's still kind of low. Ethan. Okay. E-man. All right. We're going to try it like this. Is that a little bit better? We're going to keep talking. I think that that's fine. We just have to hit, hit that volume button just a little bit, but it, I can hear you very clearly. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to, we're going to move um, as expert. Okay. We got a few. Okay. We got some thumbs up. We're excited about this. All right. Uh, so again, thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Simpkins for the, uh, the invitation. Uh, super excited about this. All right. Let's jump right on in. I'll open up with a word of prayer because it would be uh, an abdication of our duty if I were not to pray. And we get ready to talk about prayer in the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and appreciate you for how you have moved thus far. Thank you for such rich testimonies uh, that your people are able to share not only the real but the relevant experiences with your miracle working power in their lives. Now, Lord, as you are amongst us as two or three that are gathered, we ask that you would stretch, strengthen, and enlarge our faith. Your word declares, study to show thyself approval. Workmen need not be ashamed, rightly divided a word of truth. So bless our time of study instruction and education for you holy spirit are truly our teacher and you're the one that helps us to grow in our transformation towards you we love you we appreciate you and thank you in jesus name amen so what i wanted to do is to flow right into the spirit of you all's lesson and when i talk with superintendent simpkins he just so blessed me when he told me you all are studying the holy spirit as well as with faith. And I thought it would be appropriate 
uh, to do a little digging into the book of St. Luke. Now, what I'm going to do is I've shared with you all the King James Version, and I'm going to read that in its entirety. For those who like to uh, have a roadmap in terms of where we're going, I've offered that to you in a series of points, uh, as well as a summary of tonight's lesson. And then a couple of questions that you may want to pose to yourself as a part of your own journaling activity, um, it, and as well as helping you to just to reflect on the word of God, as well as how to make these things real and relevant to you. And so at the end of tonight's lesson, I want us to be able to all say that Christ teaches us from this text to ready ourselves while waiting by hoisting the sail of prayer until the wind of the Holy Spirit eventually blows upon us to fulfill his mission and purpose for our life. Amen. So I have, uh, uh, I've, uh, in my study and preaching, one of the things they say, if you can't say it in a sentence, you probably can't say it at all. So I think it's important, especially as we are sitting and combing through the word of God, that we want to be able to have a succinct understanding of what we believe the Lord wants to do. So let's look at Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And this is the King James Version. And it reads as such. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, verse 2, uh, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. All right. Amen, amen, and amen. So because it's Bible study, I, 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 first off, y'all need to know, I love studying the Word of God. This is my jam. This is what I get excited about. And so one of the things that I think is important for us to talk a little bit about is just the background of Luke. Now, for those uh, who spend some time and have been going to Sunday school, y'all know Luke was a physician. He was a Gentile. He was also the writer, not only of the book of Luke, but also of Acts. But let's go a little bit deeper. One of the things when we understand about the New Testament is specific ways in which the New Testament was written, taking into account the first century knowledge as it relates to how information was communicated. So there's different types of gospels. Um, obviously, we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but when we think about the book of Luke, it's actually not considered to be a true biographical narrative, a first century biographical narrative. What a biographical narrative is, is that it's simply intended to relate the historical uh, understanding of that particular person so that you can understand the virtues or the source of their virtues. So many times the biographical narrative uh, whether it would be of a Julius Caesar, but specifically of Christ that we're familiar with, is that it provides this incredible birth narrative that helps us to understand why this person was significantly important. So Matthew and Mark are both biographical narratives, but Luke is different. Luke is a historiographical narrative, and its focus and its intent is to provide an orderly account. It's intended not to be what we would call a chronological type of letter, but it's intended to be a, a type of narrative that says, let me identify these critical events that's tied to the story of the church. And as I pull out these stories, these events, I'm going to tie them to the person of Jesus. And then I'm going to tie Jesus uh, to the Old Testament uh, in, in, in the book of Luke. Now, what's also amazing, and many of you all know this, y'all would say, who's written most of the New Testament? And the answer, our Sunday school answer is Paul. And you would be absolutely right if we're thinking about that question in the sense of who wrote the most, the, the most number of letters. But if you actually total up the number of words that are included in those, in those letters, the answer would actually be different. 
because Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He's actually the person that wrote the most number of words within the New Testament. Hallelujah. Isn't this good news for Bible study? So when one is thinking about the New Testament church, one has to have a, a real working knowledge of the person of Luke and the book of Luke as well as the book of Acts. Now, here's what's the other thing, is that the book of Luke and the book of Acts were always intended to be read together. Now, we know that the New Testament is organized in, in terms of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, so on and so forth. So many times for us, we think, well, John comes right after Luke. But in reality, Luke always intended for Luke and Acts to be read together. So what's amazing about that, because again, first century technology caused him to be limited in the way in which he would communicate. What are you saying by that, Pastor? So a papyrus, a, a typical papyrus roll had the ability to write 20,000 words on it. And so guess how many words are in the book of Luke? Just over 19,000. So the reason why Luke and Acts are actually separated is because the technology did not exist for them to be together. Isn't that good? But this is good stuff to learn. So why am I, why you say, okay, well, all right, that's great little Bible study facts. But why is that important for us as we're talking about the Holy Spirit and the and prayer? Excuse me. Here's why that's important. When you read Luke, you have to read it anticipating what's going to occur in the book of Acts. And when you read Acts, you have to read it remembering what took place in Luke. Let me say it one more time. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? When you read Luke, you have to read it anticipating what's going to occur in the book of Acts. Y'all know what happens in Acts chapter 2. They was up in that upper room obeying God for those 10 days. And the Bible says the spirit came in like a mighty rushing wind. Peter then began to prophesy and declare that this is what Joel spoke of in Acts chapter 2. It says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your sons shall see. Y'all know what we're talking about, right? The indwelling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit that comes to live on the inside of every blood washed, water baptized believer that has a confession of faith in Christ who is our risen redeemer. The Holy Spirit that comes as the earnest, the eternal guarantee of our sanctification and salvation living on the inside of us, hallelujah, that gives us even the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, this is what's critically important, and I share this with our congregation. When we think of Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church has always been the central facilitator in which God wants to administer his kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the reign rule, uh, of God's redemptive agency within the earth. And so the way in which God wants to influence the world has always been through the church, which is why we must be on guard as the, as the church and as the people of God when we hear persons say what I believe are demonically inspired statements such as, I didn't leave God, I left the church. Listen, God said upon this rock, I will build my church. Church ain't perfect, but God is building us. God is the one that is keeping us. God is the one that is preserving us. And so when we say that the church is the central facilitator of the kingdom of God, God enlightens us with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he gives us his language. And we have that language, we have that prophetic authority to speak the heart, the mind, and the will of God, not just in worship services. Come on, somebody. That's why I love when your pastor, when superintendent was saying it's more than a title, because more than the pulpit in the church, God is calling many of us to be preaching on our jobs and preach. And when we say preaching, I mean being able to have the Holy Spirit's inspired language in you so that you can advocate for justice in spaces that require a whole nother language. Don't you know that there's a language? I heard there's a teacher. There's a language in the educational field that needs spirit-filled believers that can advocate for a child's IEP. 
Hallelujah. Because there's some persons that are being put in special education would just simply need a different level of advocacy and support in order to them to become the best person that God intended them to be. Come on, somebody. We need persons that have the ability to speak business language, who can bring their spirit-filled understanding and say, listen, it's not right for us to profit at the expense of other people's lives. We need spirit-filled believers who are appointed and anointed and identified by God, bringing Holy Ghost spirit-filled language of his identity and prophetically charging what God has said. Now, here's where we go. When we look Again, so when we look at the book of Luke, we got to look forward and we got to anticipate what God is going to do in the book of Acts. And when you read Acts, you got to look back at what Christ has already done in the person of what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we see this verse in Luke chapter 18, Jesus says, I love it. He says, and he spake a parable unto them. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. Not to faint. There's a word right there, not to faint. When, when I think of particular groups of people, especially, um, I'm going to pull out these two, specifically women and especially African Americans. These are some of the most resilient uh, groups and, and categories of people that I can think of in my life. Some of the most resilient, I mean, just tough. I remember uh, when, and, and, and I'm not trying to offend nobody, but I remember when President Trump uh, had, uh, when it was realized that he was going to win the election, and there were many persons who were on my job, and they were just all distraught, and they were crying, and, and, and they were upset. I can't believe that this many people would vote for a man like this and other Christians and things like that. And they were just in tears and they were upset and, and things of that nature. And, and so we have been getting, we have been getting authority to tell people that they could go home early and uh, they can take a day off. I mean, it was, it was that level of, of grief and, and upsetness. Is that a word? They were just upset about the outcome of the election. And, uh, and, and I remember, I was saying to somebody, I, 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 I'll be here tomorrow um, because for those of us who've experienced life, the difficulties of life, know what it's like when life is just unfair. Many of us have been dealt bad hands over and over and over again. And what it has done is that it's built in us. Many times as a people, when you've gone through Jim Crow and and slavery and peonage and, 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 and all types of abuse and mass criminalization and all these other different things, you develop a level of toughness. When you've had to figure out how to feed your family uh, with $20 a week and you got a family of five, you, you develop a level of resilience and toughness. You, you can't just be upset uh, one day and then you just lose your mind just because things didn't work out that way. Uh, because many for us, we get dealt bad hands all the time. So the question is not whether or not we're going to experience hardship. The question is not whether or not we're going to have to wait. And I recognize that in our generation and in our time, waiting is not considered to be a virtue. Everything is about the sense of immediacy and quickness and how rapid can you produce something? How quickly can you ascend? How quickly can you be promoted? How quickly can you advance? And so there's this sense uh, that that waiting is almost like punishment. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we wait for the fulfillment of God's promises in our life? Or another way to ask the question is are we waiting well for the promises of God? So we want to make sure that us as a people, that we are waiting well. Let the church say waiting well, because you're going to have to wait, but we might as well wait well. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to break down Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at a couple of verses. I've given you all a little bit of the Greek. If you want to look at it, if you don't, it's all good. I ain't mad at you, but we, you know, it's Bible study. So we got to break this down just a little bit. Okay. So verse one, it says, and he spake, somebody say spake, Greek word elegon, it's a parable, it says he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray, that word pray, uh, and not to faint. Now, here's why I wanted us to see uh, what I would call the, the verb categories of these Greek terms, elegon. Uh, is an imperfect indicative active. 
it implies that the action or state expressed by the verb is ongoing or in progress. Now, I want you to do this with your Holy Spirit-filled self. When you read Luke chapter 18, and it says, and he spake. Imagine as if the word, the living word of God, the abiding God, the abiding presence of God, the loving presence of God is still speaking to you right now. He didn't just speak it in the past. He's still speaking it to you right now. He's speaking as if it's intended to come alive on the inside of you. He's speaking it as if he wants it to, he wants to make it real and relevant unto you. And you all know he, the Bible says he spake a story, a parable. I love it. The Bible talks in Psalms 8, 78, I believe it is. It says he'll speak to us in parables and in dark sayings. Parables, many of us, we know them as those, those heavenly stories with earthly meanings. But if we go a little bit deeper, parables really speak to how God intends to work in the earth. When heaven is this incredible mismatch uh, or this mashing together with the earth, uh, um, that Jesus even said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's, it's literally accessible and available right now. It's accessible and available through, the, through a redemptive relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. And so when you hear saints in church saying, reach up and grab it, they ain't just playing with you. If you by faith can recognize that God is not deep in out of space, but he is near, he's accessible, he's available, he's a present help in the time of trouble. And the Bible says, and he spake. Again, imperfect, indicative, active. That means it's a still a speaking. It's a ongoing. He's still speaking this proverb, this parable into the lives of his people. And he says here, men ought to always pray and not faith. Again, praying, praying, praying. That word, prosakatai, present infinitive middle. It speaks to progressive. It pictures the action expressed by the verb as being in progress. So again, continual. So prayer is not just that thing we did that one time we was on trouble. This is why you hear saints say a prayer life. Or some of the old mothers would talk about a prayer wheel that would be turning on the inside. Just like a circle that has no end is how prayer ought to be operating on the inside of a believer. Somebody say, keep going. Now, here's what I love about parables. Parables, look what he does. Jesus, who is a master teacher, and what he does with parables is that he invites us in by disarming us so that he can give us his instrument, the instrumentality of his presence. He invites us in by disarming us so that he can literally arm us, arm us with the instrumentality of his presence. Here's what he does. He says, listen, he spake a parable unto them, and he said, men, somebody say, men ought to always pray and not faint. But then he tells the story about a woman. Don't you miss it? Hallelujah. Jesus is so, so divinely clever. He is so celestially astute that the Bible says, he says, men ought to always pray and not faint. Then he tells a story about a woman. Hallelujah. He tells a story about a woman because you got to recognize that in that particular time, people did not have particular regard for women. But Jesus, who recognizes that women are the imago Dei made in the image of God, he says, listen, hallelujah, I know you may not respect them, but they are a reflection of my image. And I'm going to use their tenacity and their resilience as a model of how you ought to learn how to pray. Woo Jesus, hallelujah, I love Jesus. So he tells a story about a woman, and here's what you got to see. He doesn't give the woman a name. I love when God is anonymous because anonymity suggests inclusivity. So that means if God doesn't give a name, you can insert your name there. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And so the Bible says, and there was in a city a judge which feared not God, which neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city. Now, widow, not only... Not only is she a woman, but you got to consider her to be, um, uh, I'll call it a double minority, right? Because not only, because she's, a, she's not only a woman, but she's a widow woman, which means she doesn't have a husband as a covering. 
which was considered to be meaning that she would then be upon public assistance. She would be needed. Uh, she would need the assistance of the social system of that particular time. All right. So keep going. All right. So now we got any spake a parable unto them. Man, I've always prayed not faith. Tells the story. Y'all know this story, right? Now, here's what I want to do. I want to go down to verse. Uh, you know what? Let me do this. The reason why we want to remember verse one, because that's the point. I almost got the point. Jesus teaches us that prayer makes us resilient and hopeful. Somebody say, and hopeful. Let me drink some tea. Think about that. Resilient and hopeful. Resilient and hopeful. Remember, the goal is not just to wait, but to wait well. You ever seen people waiting, but with an attitude? That's not the type of wait we're talking about. That's not the type of waiting that's a reflection of the Holy Spirit that is producing the right type of perspective, personality, and attitude. And so we not only want to wait, but we want to wait well and wait with hope. And so this is what Jesus is teaching us about prayer. Prayer makes us the right kind of resilient and the right kind of hopeful. Let me tell you a quick story. There's a young boy uh, who for weeks, he had been eager with anticipation and he went on a sailboat outing with his grandfather. And to his disappointment, the boy said, dad, granddad, there's no, there's no wind, there's no little breeze. And it resulted in the boat basically being stagnant, not moving anywhere quickly, not going in any particular direction that he liked. So his wise grandfather said to him, Son, the wind's going to come. And the old man says, here's what we got to do. In the meantime, while we wait for the wind, we got to hoist our sails. That's what prayer is. Prayer is hoisting your sail of hope, awaiting the blowing of the wind of the Holy Spirit to guide your activity and to produce the righteous action as a reflection of his presence living on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Somebody say hoist the sail. So we got to hoist our sail in prayer. And that leads us to the second point. The Holy Spirit infuses our waiting with active, assertive, and aggressive participation in prayer. Somebody say active. Somebody say assertive. Somebody say aggressive participation in prayer. Would you all mind just dropping in the chat uh, the time you all regularly pray together? Just drop it in the chat. Just drop it in the chat just so everybody, just in case some people forgot about it, Superintendent, because we, sometimes we forget, right? We just, just drop the times and the dates uh, in the chat because the Holy Spirit infusing infuses our waiting with active, assertive, and aggressive participation in prayer. You say, Pastor, where is that in the text? Man, I gave it to you in the notes. It's right there in verse three. Y'all gonna, gonna see it. Y'all gonna be like, oh yeah, it was right there all along. I tell the people at my church, man, when we read too fast, sometimes we miss too much. But if we slow down, we'll be able to catch up to what God wants to reveal to us. Look at verse three. And it says, in this story, there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversary. All right, look at verse three. Widow came in that city, in that widow in that city, she came unto him to come. That's the word erkato, right? Greek word erkato. And the Bible says, and said, uh, Legusa, avenge me, saying, Legusa, avenge me of mine adversary. Now, y'all might be saying, hey, that's a pretty good scripture. I love that. We see this widow woman who is seeking justice for her life, but she has to go to an unjust judge. <clears throat> and because of her perseverance, her perseverance and persistence, this unjust judge res responds to her. But here's what I want you all to see in verse three, what we're learning from Jesus. That Greek word, lagusa, it's a present participle active. You got it there in your notes. Y'all going to see it and y'all going to be like, ooh, we, I'm so glad he pointed that out. This is why we love Bible study. You should have your highlighting Bible out with the, with the highlighters and the pen and all of that stuff. My wife got like eight Bibles and she does this all day long. Okay, so present participle active. 
It communicates an action that occurs simultaneously during the main verb's action. Let me say that again. It says it communicates an action that occurs simultaneously with the main verb's action. One more time, don't miss it. The second verb, lagusa, present participle active, a present participle active, it's a action that occurs at the same time as the main verb's action. What's the main verb's action you are saying? It's the word erkato. It's imperfect indicative middle. It speaks to the continuing or the repeated action in the past. Hallelujah. This is what this is literally saying. Not only did she come, but she said. She came and she prayed. Woo wee Hallelujah. She kept coming and she kept praying. She didn't just keep coming because there's some folks that are coming to church, but they ain't. Y'all ain't talking to me. And then there's some folks that are saying they praying, but they ain't, no, come on. We need both of the action. Somebody, I'm coming and I'm praying. How, that's what it means to be active, aggressive, and assertive in your participation. It's not just to show up, but it's to show up with a prayerful heart, mind, and attitude. You've got to hoist, and I've got to hoist the sails. We got to ready ourselves in prayer and say, God, we are waiting for you to blow your wind upon us. Here's what I love about this, because how many times have we heard people say, almost in a pejorative sense, I'm tired of your thoughts and your prayers. That's because you don't understand the impetus of the type of prayer that we as New Testament believers have been unctioned by the Holy Spirit upon. You don't understand that our prayer always was intended to coincide with our action. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, as we pray, God is putting edge on our activity and we're not just going to act without praying and we're not just going to pray without acting. We're going to do both. Yep, we can do both. Yes, we can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. We are ambidextrous in the spirit. Hallelujah. There are some of us in the name of Jesus. We have become obese in prayer because you're not producing compassionate action. And there's some of us, hallelujah, who are uh, uh, who are of a scarcity of prayer, but you just come doing stuff. And so you're erratic in your activity. God says, I've come to bring a balance by way of this widow woman that tells you not only do you got to keep coming, but you got to keep praying. And it's a reminder, hallelujah, that sometimes many persons think that prayer is passive inactivity, but that is not the case because we see the example of this woman. We see that prayer is not the abandonment of effort. Prayer is not an invitation to sleep. Prayer is not an invitation to get dormant and, and wayward. Uh, prayer is not an invitation to lose focus. Prayer is not an opportunity uh, to get on cruise control and just kind of chillax and have fun. And, and you ain't got to really be all that intentional. No, prayer, baby. Even when the babies is praying, you got to be listening for the whispers of the Holy Spirit through their spirits. Hallelujah. When you are committed to praying and hoisting that sail, as you all are believing God to burn that mortgage, baby, you got to show up. You not only have to give, but you got to pray too. You got to show up with your finances, but you got to show up with your faith as well. And as you wait, this is how we wait well. Hallelujah. We're not just waiting. We're not going to be like those persons in the Flintstones. Y'all remember the Flintstones? You know, you had the people who had their feet up in the back. Hallelujah. Not doing nothing. Just adding weight. Thank you, Jesus. We want to be those that are putting feet to ground. We are paddling our foot. We are contributing not with our complaints, but with our prayerful participation that is active, that is assertive, that is aggressive. We are not passive. We are not inactive. We are not dormant. We are not asleep. But God is waiting for us to be active in prayer. God is waiting for us to be assertive in prayer. God wants us to assert ourselves under the authority of Christ's command, which is what? To pray and not faint. Woo-wee. This is the cold part. Because when you look at the text, he's telling us about an unjust judge. And an unjust judge, I mean, is just being mean by making you wait. 
But when a just judge makes your way, oh, somebody come on in the building. When a, when a righteous king, when an everlasting father, when the prince of peace makes you wait, that means he's doing something else. That means, hallelujah, sometimes the request we have is beyond our present reach. And because it's beyond our present reach, it requires, let me throw this word out there, maturity. It requires, as I can imagine, I can hear you superintendent saying, saints, we got to grow up. Ooh! And the reason why he's saying you got to grow up is that there's some, some prayer requests that's on the top level shelf of heaven that requires that the people of God grow up in kindness, grow up in forgiveness, grow up in patience, grow up in love, grow up in justice, grow up in their Bible rooting, grow up in their commitment to prayer. And as you grow up, now you're able to reach things that were once out of your reach. Thank you, Jesus. And so this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is, hallelujah, not only is he the author and finisher of our faith, let me throw this out there to you. He's also the author of our waiting. Mm. Hallelujah. Think about that. I, I, I know he can, he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. God, God can burn your, he could have burned your mortgage yesterday. That, that, that's, that's a, I, me, me and superintendent were talking about this. I said, God's ability to meet you all's requests, that's not, that's a bat of his eyelash. That ain't too hard for God. There's nothing too hard for God. He's the one that can make Pharaohs let go of his people. He's the one that can open up barren wombs. He's the one that can make the dead give up. It's, it, it's it, who he's holding captive. That, that's the God that we serve. He's the one that can cause us to walk on water. He's the one that can heal. He can heal the sick and raise the dead. He can feed 5,000 and 4,000, raise Jairus's daughter and heal the woman with the issue. That, that God's power is unmatched. But what do you do when God says, wait? When God is the author, the reason why you're waiting. When God is the one that is saying not yet. When God is the one that's putting a pause on our request, not because y'all, y'all, y'all like me, y'all, you know how we have parents uh, and they would, uh, you'd ask, you'd ask for stuff and say, uh, can we have such and such? And they would tell you no. And the reason why they told you no is because they didn't have no money. Um, uh, but it's a different conversation when you have money and you're still saying no. This is why some, some of our children are spoiled because we believe that because we have now, that means we ought to spoil them and not really train them to walk in the things of God. It, it, that's not the lesson. Let's keep going. And so when God makes us wait, when God, who is the author and finisher of our faith, when he's the author of our waiting, the question is not why do we have to wait? That's not the question question we should be asking ourselves is how, somebody say how, are we supposed to wait? How are we supposed to wait? We're supposed to wait with a bad attitude, supposed to wait, um, being upset when we see other persons get what we're waiting for. How are we supposed to wait? How, how are we supposed to wait towards justice? How, how are we supposed to wait for reconciliation? How, how are we supposed to wait for the things that we've asked God to do? How, how? You know, when we talk about justice, how, how are we supposed to wait? Oh, we got, a, we got a camera thing. Is it okay, sir? It died. Okay, get another one, all right? Can y'all still hear me? I hope y'all can still hear me. Praise the Lord. They can still hear me? Okay, thank you, sir. We hear you, yes. Keep on. We hear okay. you, too. We hear you, too, Pastor. <laughs> So here's the last point, and then I'll turn it over to superintendent. We can ask questions or all those things. The last point is this. The Holy Spirit is the prayer source of our ability to meet the requirements of faithfulness. Let me say it one more time. The Holy Spirit is the prayer source of our ability to meet the requirements of faithfulness. There's a passage of scripture um, that we must remember, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says that uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, I love him, says one plants, one waters. God gives the increase. And 
the humble thing about prayer, prayer reminds us that we are limited. That we are human beings. That we have limited resources. And when we humble ourselves, we're literally saying there are things, God, that I can do, but there's things only that you can do. And when we talk about the things that God can do, look at verse, look at verse eight. And this is why we want to, I want to encourage you all as it relates to the operation of the Holy Spirit. Verse eight says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man coming, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, I love that word find. It's purisai. It's a future indicative action. Actions that will be performed in the future by the subject of the sentence. Now you're saying, what do you mean? Jesus. Y'all, I, I, I think it's important for us as the church to remember that Jesus is soon to return. We are living in the last days. This is the time of the last days and Jesus is, is soon to return. But Jesus asks a rhetorical question. He literally says, will I find pistis, faith? Will I have a will I find a confidence in the Son to produce justice and love and, and answer the promises of God? Will I find that type of faith on the earth? And literally, when we say that waiting for God is an active, aggressive, assertive act under the authority of Christ's command, we're praying because Christ commanded us. But when he says, Will I find faith on the earth? The only way that we can meet God's requirements and expectations is by us simply surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The only way to become everything that God has imagined for your life is you gotta surrender. And you cannot rely on surrender from 10 years ago to be possible for the surrender of the challenges that you are facing on today. And so this is why it's important when you are reading the book of Luke to remember Luke is pointing towards Acts. And what happens in the book of Acts? What happens in the act in the book of Acts is the fulfillment of the promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit that is available to every blood-washed, spirit-filled, water-baptized believer. And this is why when you look in the book of Acts, you're going to see and you will see. And I know you all will look at this and some of you all who are who are eager uh, and earnest in your Bible studies, you're going to see how many times you see the church praying. You see them praying when they appointed ap a, an apostolic replacement in Acts 1. You see them praying when they experience persecution in Acts 4. You see them praying when they were looking to identify leadership within the church in Acts 6. You see them praying about how they were to deal with the question of the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. You see them praying when Peter found himself in prison. You see them praying about leadership decisions in Acts 14. You see even the, them praying when the Apostle Paul was establishing elders and, and bishops and pastors in different locations. You see them praying. You see the church, somebody say praying. And they were able to pray without ceasing because of them simply saying, I yield, I surrender, I submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the source, hallelujah, of you and I being able to grow, to increase, to enlarge and advance. This is why it's not by any works of righteousness. It's really just by surrender. It's really by work, a work of humility. There are many of us, you are looking, you are, you are being driven by ambition, hallelujah, but really your promotion is in your submission. Your promotion in the things of God is in your ability to humble yourself, to surrender, to submit. And it's not until we submit, hallelujah, hallelujah, that we then see the Holy Spirit perfecting the work that he has already started in us when we have made a confession of faith. All right, so that is the conclusion. And I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to superintendency if there's any questions. But again, Christ teaches us how to ready ourselves while waiting by doing what? Hoisting the sail of prayer until the wind of the Holy Spirit, and I love this word, eventually blows.
Hallelujah. We don't know when he's going to blow, but he is going to blow. Hallelujah. There's confidence that we have. We have the guarantee that the Holy Spirit is going to blow. And when he blows upon us, that will give us the ability to fulfill his mission and purpose for our life. God bless you. I just want, I, I just want you to know I was absolutely blessed in this Bible study, in this English lesson, in this Greek lesson. <laughs> uh, that's what this is all about. The next level of Bible study. Glory to God. Paul talked about the fact that when we should have been eating meat, all we could handle was milk. But come on, somebody put in the chat box, I'm eating meat. Glory to God. I'm, I'm, I'm putting it. I'm, I'm eating meat. Glory to God. I'm, I'm able to eat meat. What a powerful uh, Bible study. Glory to God. I'm eating meat. Absolutely wonderful meat. Glory to God. I'm, I'm waiting and in the process I'm growing up so, so my prayer life, so I can reach, come on, top shelf blessings. <laughs> top shelf. <laughs> All right. Any questions, any comments? Glory to God. Y'all got a few minutes. Any questions? You you blessed our hearts, Pastor. Come on, one more time. Everybody put hearts and uh, amen. Some hands up. Glory to God. Some signs of appreciation for what God has done through this man of God and ministering to us tonight. I see the brunettes, glory to God. Okay. Hey man, I really enjoyed the um, lesson on tonight. One thing that's really struck me is when you said, when you surrender, you cannot be surrendering like you did 10 years ago today. And it's, it, that made me think about my my level of surrendering has to be constantly evolving, you know, and it, so that's what struck me, you know, because sometimes I, I, I'm reluctant to surrender. I'm reluctant to evolve. I'm reluctant to grow, but I have to be continually able to surrender and continue to evolve in this walk with God. Woo! Uh, look, look like uh, Brother Klingscale and then Sister Gina. Yes, uh, for me, uh, just kind of, kind of, sort of piggybacking off of uh, Deacon Burnett. You, you know, you, I think the difference between the the surrendering now, as opposed to back when. I literally wasn't right, was actually surrendering was quitting, giving up. That's what it was for me. Just throw in the towel, forget it. I'll use that F word. And that's where my life was. But now I have to ask the Lord to come into my life and make me over. The whole thing is not, it's not quitting when you're saying surrender. Now it's saying, I quit messing around and I'm surrendering to you, Heavenly Father. Guide my footsteps, Woo! make me better, make me strong in the name of Jesus. This, that's what it is for me now. So thank you, uh, Pastor, for those awesome words. And this was a great lesson. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Gina. Hey, before you go, Sister Gina, I just want to grab a hold of what Brother Klingscale said. There's another program that I that I have was involved in with many years, and they had a phrase that says, surrender to win. Glory to God. Surrender to win. Come on, Sister, uh, Sister Gina, and then Sister Charlene, and then whoever the iPhone is. Amen. God bless everyone. I give an honor to God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I, I got on a little late, but I'm glad I got on when I did because I got on at the start of the actual lesson. And it was a blessing to me on tonight. Thank you, sir, for how you share. Um, one of the key things for me is that that first scripture, 18 and 1, where it said men ought to always pray and to not faint. Um, one of our one of our uh, deacons on our prayer lines in the morning. That's one of his favorite scripture, and it always it, because it's telling us that we have to be continuing continuously in prayer. Every situation that we find ourselves in, 
requires prayer. I mean, it doesn't mean, even when things are going good, you know, like we pray and thank God for the things that are going good, but it just, it's just a blessing to, you know, to, to, to hear uh, messages like this because it's encouraging, it's inspiring. And um, that just, that just, you know, spoke to me, you know, like men ought to always pray. And that means women too. We have to That's always right. pray and not think. Amen. So thank you That's for that right. message. I truly enjoyed it. God bless you. God. Sister Charlene. Praise God. Thank you so much. Oh, Pastor Hillman, that, that is my pastor, and I love him so much. And this word, oh my God. Woo! Talking Ooh. about teach, Pastor. Woo! But praise God. I love every moment. I mean, you dropped so many nuggets, but I'm a tag team on or um, when you said the only way we can meet God's expectations is to surrender to the Holy Spirit. And that makes me think of, you said a today surrender, because I think of a today surrender is, is one that would give us a future hope and a future faith. And, and when I think about surrendering, I think about the word where it says in the book of Luke, Luke 9 and 3, it says, if anyone, not, not 9, 3, 9 and 23, then he said to them all, not some, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So that's a daily surrender. When, when we talk about a today surrender, that's a daily surrender. And we can't reach back to that, like Pastor said, that 10 year surrender. We got to think about what I'm doing today. And it's continually praying, it's continually holding on to the hand of God, continually fasting, continually just trusting and believing God. So I, I'm going to hold on. I'm a daily surrender and I'm going to continue to believe God and for his word. Because when he can, when Jesus come back, I want him to find faith in me. I, I want him to find that faith in me. Praise God. But thank you, Pastor. Him. Thank you, um, Solid Rock Church. This has been truly a blessing to me. God bless you all. Thank you, Sister Brown, uh, Sister Armstrong Brown. Uh, iPhone. God bless you, Pastor. This is uh, Elder Lambert. Oh, uh, hey, man. How you doing? I'm blessed. Blessed. Enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the Bible study. One of the things that, that really caught my attention was uh, that prayer, you know, we're supposed to pray believing, right? The Bible tells us to pray believing. And when he tied that into an action, that that not only do I need to believe, but I need to add some legwork behind my prayer and be persistent in my prayer and be active in my prayer. And that the way he tied that in is that I'm not just sitting down praying. I'm not passive, but I'm active in my prayer. So that that really stuck home for me. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, Pastor, did you want to share something else? Glory to God as we're summarizing and coming to a close. Y'all, y'all got it. I, I am, I'm just blessed by you all's responsiveness as you all were, were expounding. I just was sitting there thinking about my surrender from yesteryear and how that is insufficient for the surrender for today. And if I got, if I just married myself to what I used to do, then I would miss out on what God wants to do in the present to give me hope for the future. And so, for example, you can even think of what you used to give as a tither, whatever that amount was. And at the, at, you know, 10 years ago when you were given a thousand dollars, oh, that was a, that was a stretch of your faith. Now you give that without blinking. Because things have changed, and now it requires a more dynamic kind of sur sur surrender and sacrifice to really say, I'm trusting God, and I want to be sensitive to the Lord, and I don't want to just get, because some, you know, especially when we start comparing ourselves with other people, you know, we, we see that sister who's struggling, and we like, well, I, you know, she barely can pray, and I know how to pray, but God is saying, I, I'm looking at your heart and how intentional you are with your heart and listening to me. And so there's, I love that word dynamic, dynamic yes. my surrender. That means I got to make, I can't just close my eyes and just do it. I got to be, I got to be alert. I got to be aware and awake to what God wants me to do. Who's that person he wants me to hug this Sunday? Who's that person that has, that I, that God wants me to have a word of encouragement for instead of just be thinking about 
is are they gonna sing my song and is superintendent gonna say something to me and is first lady gonna apologize for the last time she didn't talk to me it's now saying i want to be dynamic and show up because i'm called of god and how does god want me to make myself available and to be used of him to offer a word of encouragement to put fifty dollars in somebody's hand so that they can know that god loves them and that god sees them now it means okay i can't just show up upset and, and being mad and having unforgiveness, I got to get that stuff off my heart, out of my mind and, and make myself available. But superintendent, to you and first lady, you all have been such uh, amazing uh, sources of strength and encouragement. And I thank God for you, sir. Uh, I owe you a dinner. I told you I'm, I'm coming out to take you out because I got to get I got to get some more of that wisdom from you, sir. But I, I'm going to be quiet now. I love you. I love you and Lady D. Hillman. They are awesome people. Now we're going to just uh, hear these last three individuals and then we're going to move forward. Sister Lisa Beverly, Deaconess Lisa Beverly, Missionary Lenita Hunter, and Lady Sheila Simpkins, the Jewel. Um, I just wanted to share as um, the pastor was speaking, um, it came to Proverbs 3 and 6 In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So by prayer, we're acknowledging, when you pray, when you're praying to somebody, you're acknowledging them, you know, and, and we do that by faith, you know, I mean, by our belief and our trust in him. So when it, you know, it's just every time that I pray, you know, that gives God, God knows that I believe in him and I trust him because I'm coming to him. Like that woman went to the judge. You know, even knowing that he was an unjust, but she knew that that is the way she had to go. So it just for me, I know where I need to go. And I just want to thank you so much for letting me share that. But that that came to me, you know, Proverbs 3 and 6, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. We have to put Jesus first because that's the only way that we can get to the, to God. And it's, and it's it's throughout the Bible. So, you know, I mean, as you, that's what I was talking about. I, you do. Pastor, you get so excited about the word because that word leads to that word and that, you know, so and I really, really enjoyed this lesson. I, I just, I'm so excited about this. And thank you so much for sharing this with me tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 I'm I'm like the deacon as Beverly. I am so excited. I am so excited. I just don't know what to do. I am journaling. I even wrote on my little whiteboard here. Prayer is not the abandonment of effort. Oh my God, that did something to my soul. <laughs> I mean, I just, I was, I almost leaped. Prayer is not the abandonment of effort. Yes, I'm praying for you, but I love you and love is an action word. So I'm going to see what I can do. I don't know if that's going to be Instacart. I don't know if it's going to be me driving over. I don't know if it's going to be a hug. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be some effort. I can't, we, that's my yesteryear. I'm praying for you, sis. And yes, I pray for him, but what is the action? And so I just want to add in there as y'all Christian education director, whatever that is, <laughs> remember your <laughs> here journal. Remember that. What did you highlight? What was explained? How will you apply it? And how will you respond? Don't walk away from this and do nothing. I can't just explain that enough. Don't walk away from something this rich I also put in the chat our YouTube channel. That YouTube channel is also in our e-blast. So y'all, let's use this. Um, I do see Mother Carpenter um, continues to unmute. If she may not know how to raise her hand if she has something to say. So if we wanna make sure she gets her word, I'll pass it over to my first lady and I'm gonna be quiet. I will make sure she gets something to say as soon as first lady finishes. We Amen. Don't, we're gonna Amen. get all right time wise y'all. Amen. Praise God. I have enjoyed everything I have heard. But what I've heard most of all, don't get too comfortable in this thing. Don't get in that run a meal thing. That's what I got from the whole lesson. This is a new thing each and every day. So we can't just get, okay, well, I'm here now. So I'm there. It's just always more and more and more and more for us to get. And I just want to say, I just thank God for this powerful word tonight and for the wonderful speaker, teacher, pastor, leader. All of those wonderful things. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Amen, First Lady, because I really enjoyed it tonight, too. And all I got to say is confirmation to what me and the pastor talked, to, talked about yesterday. We can never stop praying. I really enjoyed that about prayer. 
because I am for the prayer. If you pray, we'll have more power. People will be healed. It's just, oh, I just love that word. I'm so excited. I don't even know what to say. I'm just saying I know that it's confirmation because we talked about everything he talked about tonight. Me and the pastor talked about yesterday. Amen. I just thank God for this time, too. I really do. And I'm so excited about prayer because I know prayer will change things. Yes, it will. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mother. That was wonderful. You, you didn't have to tell them what we talked about. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was wonderful. We had a great conversation. But thank God. Amen. For everybody who joined in tonight, there are 44 devices. There was 44. I only saw 44 earlier. So this is holding us together. And I love the uh, the persistence, the diligence of the saints of God and to wait to the benediction. Amen. So that we can get whatever nuggets might come. Glory to God in the prayer that closes us. Let me ask everybody to get your best seed together. Everybody sow into this word tonight. You need to sow into this fertile soil. Glory to God. You need to sow into this for your own benefit. Glory to God. Don't get comfortable with what you used to give. We used to ask folks for $10, right, uh, for Bible study. But why don't you tonight uh, stretch yourself and see if you can't reach top shelf. Glory to God. See if you can't do something differently tonight. I'm just going to ask everybody to do that. Uh, glory to God. I want to tell you that uh, um, um, Missionary Hunter has put on this, that uh, these the, the series, the Bible study series that we're involved in will be on the Solid Rock YouTube channel. Glory to God. So we had to pick those up. Uh, the, the brunettes and the ivories and glory to God. They telling you right now that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can take part in what you just learned. Glory to God. You can press in glory to God with more passion and more glory to God fervor uh, with more energy with more faith, glory to God, to prayer Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 noon, and then 6 a.m. at Tuesday and Thursday morning, glory to God, on this same Zoom line, glory to God. So press in, glory to God, so that God can give you, amen, what he's been wanting to give you for a while, but now you're stretching for it. Is that all right? Glory to God. That's interesting. You said God is the author of the weight. <laughs> Ah, glory to God. Amen. Because if he didn't want you to wait, he could change it right away. But God is the one. All right. I, that was good stuff. Glory to God. I, all right. I'm asking everybody, make sure you give that gift. Glory to God. I want to encourage you that our um, uh, next weekend, glory to God, on that Friday, on that Saturday, uh, just to kind of give us a little bit of an announcement, but Mother Hazel Waters home going to uh, celebration will take place. Uh, and that's going to be at the New Sweet Home Church at 11 o'clock. Uh, and so we're going to celebrate this great woman of God, this great family of God. Pastor Waters was a pastor in our district and jurisdiction, glory to God, for uh, many years. Uh, and before that, he was at New Sweet Home and then Calvary Temple. So he's been here for I don't know how long. He's the, they, this is the mother and father of uh, Bishop George Matthews, glory to God. Um, but it, we're going to make sure that, uh, that we're there to support uh, what's going on with that family. We are there. We are family. Uh, Pastor Waters has made every men's conference, every anniversary, Every pastor and wife appreciation for the 25 years we have been in ministry. So we celebrate him. We're surely going to be there as we are now standing by his side. Hospitality. Thank you, sister. 